Tonight, a worldwide exclusive, Princess Diana, as you've never heard her before. I hated myself so much, I didn't think I was good enough. This is the story the royal family doesn't want you to hear. A story so damning, Diana had to record it secretly on tape. My husband made me feel so um, inadequate in every possible way. She hoped the tapes would change her life for the better. They wound up changing history. Now, six years after her death, her voice will finally be heard. Diana, intimate and unrehearsed. I said, I can't know him. I can't do this. This is absolutely unbelievable. Both joyful and anguished. I was just so desperate. I knew what was wrong with me. With remarkably candid confessions and explosive revelations. I was trying to cut my wrist with razor blades. Plus never-before-seen video that offers a rare glimpse at the lighter side of a princess. I have no clue to that question. <gasps> and exclusive interviews with Diana's closest friends, some talking for the first time. Tonight, an NBC special, Princess Diana, The Secret Tapes. Good evening, I'm Jane Pauley. The Princess of Wales lived her life in public. She couldn't hide from the press if she tried, and she did try. But the public's appetite for details about Diana's life was insatiable. And still, the true story of her life, to a remarkable degree, was secret, until she told the secrets herself on six deeply personal audio tapes, the closest thing we'll ever have to her autobiography. Her own story from an unhappy but privileged childhood to a tragically mismatched marriage to her hard-won independence. NBC has acquired the tapes, which until now have only been heard by a handful of people. My own children. Oh, I'm just demented about them. There are poignant moments, especially when Diana talks about her sons, William and Harry. I hug my children to death. I get in bed with them at night and hug them. And I always say, who loves you most in the whole wide world? And they always say, mommy so important but there is bitterness too and jaw-dropping honesty you may have heard that diana tried to commit suicide but tonight you'll hear her describe it herself joel said i was crying wolf and, he, and i said i just felt so desperate and i was crying my eyes out and he said i'm not going to listen you're always doing this to me he said i'm going riding now so i threw myself down the stairs um, bearing in mind i was carrying a child Why did a woman so guarded in her public life record these very personal details? To understand the tapes, you have to go back to the beginning, when for all the world knew, Diana and Charles were planning a long and happy life together. For the royal family, as far as the journalists are concerned, you're on the outside looking in. Andrew Martin has been writing about the British royal family since 1982. He'd met Princess Diana several times, but like every member of the family, she refused to do a formal interview. The whole idea of sitting down and talking to Diana was just, it was a fairy tale. It was, you know, it was a, you're in dreamland to think about that because there was no access. I mean, the Queen has reigned for, you know, near 50 years and she's never once sat down and given an interview. When the royal family did appear, their press events were stiff, short, tightly controlled photo ops. In that world, the tiniest tidbit, a new haircut, the name of a dress designer qualified as a scoop. May we know the name of the dog, Your Majesty? Actually, the reporters who covered her had no idea what Diana was really going through at home. Unbeknownst to me and to the rest of the world, Diana was just at the end of her tether. Her husband was effectively living with another man's wife, Mother Parker Bowles, and... Nobody had a clue about it. Only a few close friends knew about her torment. One of them was Dr. James Colthurst, a wealthy aristocrat who met Diana on a skiing trip when she was 17. Colthurst, speaking publicly about Diana for the first time, says she was tired of the charade and dying to talk to the press about the miserable state of her marriage. 
there can be a level where people can tolerate so much. The sense was that she wanted to shout from the rooftops. The consequences of a tell-all interview were potentially catastrophic. Buckingham Palace could dismiss her as a lunatic. The press could turn against her. Diana might gain her freedom, but as Colthurst repeatedly warned her, the cost could be unbearable. The monarch had control over Diana's children, something she was acutely aware of. They might try to label her as psychiatrically unsound, but she would then lose her two children. Colthurst urged her to tell her story through an intermediary. A book, he argued, would give Diana more control over how the story was told. She was going to say something anyway that was going to happen, whether that was going to be a loose cannon and an uncontrolled explosion, or whether it was going to be something which people subsequently could understand her well and therefore be sympathetic to her. The question was then, you know, how could it be done? Colthurst did know one reporter he thought he could trust. Andrew Morton was working on an unauthorized biography of the princess when Colthurst arranged to meet him and offered him a chance to write the authorized kind. James kind of said, do you, do, do you want an interview? I said, yeah, of course I do. You know. Andrew phoned me one day and said, Mike, you're not going to believe this, and he was absolutely right. Morton took Colthurst to meet publisher Michael O'Mara, who had helped to promote the fairy tale version of the royal family in a series of best-selling picture books. O'Mara thought Colthurst was making the whole thing up. I took some of the books I previously published off my shelves and opened them on my desk and said, well, look at these pictures. This happy woman, smiling woman with the gorgeous kids. There she is with her husband. They're holding hands and smiling. I mean, look, these are the happiest people in the world. James said, that's the point. She's having to fake it. The four of them, princess publisher, writer, and friends, started to hatch a plan. Morton would interview a few of Diana's closest friends so he could say the most personal information in the book came from them. As for the interview with Diana... She was being followed all the time by the paparazzi. If I was seen, then that would blow the whole cuff up. It was uh, Mike's suggestion, as I remember it, that the only way to have an interview in a manageable form uh, was to, uh, to record the interview on a tape recorder. The only person who could do that was me. Morton would write interview questions and Colthurst would ask them, recording Diana's answers on tape. No one would suspect him. He came to Kensington Palace to see Diana all the time. A simple enough plan, but the four co-conspirators would soon become anxious, even frightened. There would be secret meetings outside of London, scrambler phones, even an office break-in. And with all the precautions, not one of them predicted the explosive impact these tapes would have. One afternoon in May 1991, James Coldhurst rode to Kensington Palace on a bicycle. In his basket, a small tape recorder that would rock the monarchy. The guard passed Coldhurst through, as he had many times before. Diana answered the door of her apartment in jeans and a t-shirt, ready to get to work. She howled with laughter, you know, as, as she saw the little tape recorder, and then she clipped the mic on herself. It was 2.30 in the afternoon when Coldhurst pressed the record button for the first time. Before long, the words were pouring out of her. Now that she was finally free to tell her story, Colthurst said she barely paused to take a breath. Uh, she 